Press record. Going live. Do I sound okay? You're good. Okay. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Here at Cabinets HR, we're doing our crowdfunding campaign for Cabinets HR until April 28th. It'd be great if you could share, and be even great if you could donate at the link of HTTPS CabinetsHR.co slash crowdfunding. Our guest today is Justin Shankin. Justin, are you ready to be great today? I am. Justin is an Army veteran and CEO of Shankin Security Solutions. His cybersecurity experts provide the comfort of cost-effective, tailored solutions to their clients, protecting their assets and reputations from cyber threats. Prior to co-founding Shankin Security Solutions, Justin spent over 20 years in the U.S. intelligence community, specialized in CI, cybersecurity, and insider threats for taking private industry. Justin, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Jason. I'm, I'm super stoked to be here. Thank you. So, Justin, right off the bat, define for us cybersecurity. I think a lot of people have the wrong definition of cybersecurity. What is that really? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely a loaded question and, and a large one, but uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think cybersecurity has kind of taken a life of its own, and uh, it's, it's hard for a lot of folks to really understand what that means. Um, I think the first best way for me to kind of define it is kind of explain what it's not, right? Mm -hmm. So some of the times when we think of cybersecurity and what we do to protect against that, there are a lot of bad guys and gals and entities that are out there trying to get things. And the most cost effective a way today is through stealing it through cyber threats, right? Uh, online viruses, malware, uh, you know, zero day. There's a lot of fancy terms that you may hear out there about it, but it's very cost effective for them. And unfortunately it works or unfortunately, excuse me, it works. Uh, phishing tax, et cetera. But the one thing that it's, it's not when you think of cybersecurity is uh, it's not IT security, right? So there are IT elements out there. We pay for IT, companies pay for IT, and they have lots of different softwares and things that they use for that. And those are equally important, but those aren't necessarily cybersecurity. And I think sometimes they get mislabeled that way. Um, one really good example is there's a lot of softwares that we'll find out that clients use through their IT partners or distributors or uh, even in-house and when we do penetration tests and do testing, we, we get around that stuff. Those are like guns, gates, guards, right? But when you're doing cybersecurity, you're looking for anomalies. You're looking for people of how they're tricking other people as well as using technical means to, to get in. And those software mo many times don't protect against that. So Justin, should a for-profit business and non-profit business have different concerns about cybersecurity or should regardless of the type of organization, cybersecurity should be a concern? Yeah, we've worked with nonprofits, for-profits, um, small and large. In fact, one of the other misnomers out there is that cybersecurity is only for large businesses, right? Basically, the best way to think about it is, um, one, I'm sure everyone here, everyone listening, all your listeners are going, yeah, I've heard this in the news. I've heard that in the news. I've heard this. But it gets so large, it feels so big that it happened here, happened there, and, and I'm so small, or we're under the radar, or they don't want our stuff. What you have to realize is, in a global network, you're connected to so many different things. Your company is, your information is. And if you have, you know, PII, which is pr uh, um, private personal information for your clients, whether it like HIPAA with a hospital, if you have uh, export control stuff, so ITAR, EAR, if you have your own proprietary information, your widget, your software, your source code, all that information is, uh, is absolutely targeted, let alone money that we're always hearing about, right? The ransomware, people stealing things, et cetera. So when it comes to what companies need cybersecurity, small, large, nonprofit, you have to sit down and discuss openly and honestly what your assets are. And if you were to lose blank thing, would we be in trouble? And where does blank thing sit? And many times things are connected to the internet or in-house and it, it's really worth the discussion um, of bringing on a partner for cybersecurity to help with that. Uh, it's very difficult nowadays to find cybersecurity experts. 
there is a shortage. There's not enough information out there. Uh, and, and a lot of the people that you're finding, it's either a software because it's easy to get a hold of, or uh, it's someone that took a class, right? They're really maybe an IT professional. They took a class. They feel good about it. And the folks that we bring on that we have are true experts that have done this for the government, that have done this for private industry. And those are the folks you should be looking for. Those are the certain things you should ask when you're discussing, hey, who should be my best partner in cybersecurity? Yeah, I know several health tech startups, like two or three people, you know, who probably need cybersecurity services. So when, when sort of can we start like looking at bringing on cybersecurity? I mean, employee six, employee seven, certain amount of revenue. Is there like another metric they should be using or judge this? Sure. I, again, I think it depends on what you're building and also what your compliance is, right? What your compliance needs are. Many of our clients, uh, I think the jig is up. For a long time, companies have held off on an extra cost because they've thought of cybersecurity as a security. It's got security in the name. So it must have overhead. It must be a cost. It must be something that I, I have to pay for, but I get no return on. The jig is up. If you want to do contracts with, the, with DOD right now, Department of Defense, um, you have to be CMMC certified, which stands for Cybersecurity Maturity Model uh, Certification. If you want any of those contracts, there are thousands and thousands of DOD contracts and they're just the start. The government's coming next, DHS, DOJ, all, all, the, all the government entities. Companies like Walmart, so let's get away from government. Walmart, Johnson & Johnson, if you want to have a contract with them and they're NDAs, you have to have cybersecurity protection. It's in their contract. So big companies, uh, government contracts, many of these things that, that people make their money on or their, their companies, whether small or large or seven employees or 500, they have these compliance needs and some of them try to skate by without doing it or how long they could get away with that. But it's, it's a need and it's a necessary need. And I think it's one of the first conversations that should happen of, hey, what's our business like? What are we uh, building? What are our assets? And what are our requirements for those? What are we trying to protect? One other thing that we offer for our clients too, and this was something we didn't think of when we started the business, uh, they use us as a competitive advantage. Many of our clients have flipped the script. And instead of this being a security, oh, there's a cost, um, we get nothing out of it. They take our logo, send it in with their contracts, send it in with their clients and say, we are protecting your information and they've been winning those contracts by proving we're ahead of the curve. Yeah, that's, so a, small, that's a small move. I like that. It, it was. And it was something, to be honest, I, I would love to take credit for, but uh, I, I, I shouldn't. And they were coming back going, hey, can you send us your logos? They're putting it on their websites, protected by. Um, and they're also putting it in their contracts going, not only are we going to give you the best product possible, but we're going to protect your information. And not just with us in-house, but we have experts that are doing it. So Jesse, you know, we always hear about, you know, like, you know, um, data breaches that, you know, Wendy's, Coles, JCPenney, I think there's a heck of Facebook recently, that all mm -hmm. becomes public knowledge. But my concern is what percentage of companies get hacked that they don't, like the company doesn't tell us, right? Like a, a company, a CMO might say, well, we got a hack, but we're not gonna tell anyone because it's gonna ruin our brand, right? Is that like when a company gets hacked, are they required by law to make it public or can they hide it? It depends. It depends. That's a trick question, right? It depends on the company and what the requirements are, but I, I'll tell you what happens um, more often than not. Um, what will usually happen, let's do a phishing attack because that's 90% of it's so easy to trick people than it is computers, unfortunately. And, uh, and so let, let's talk phishing. When a phishing attack happens, they're going after, it, it could be targeted like whaling, like CEOs, those certain things, but some of them are very noisy as everybody's used to and you get all these phishing emails. But what happens is, uh, I think a good example for many people that they may have experienced is when a Facebook account is attacked, right? Or hacked. They then send out from their contact list to all the other Facebook accounts, right? And then they try to trick them into something, click on this link, I need money, I need those things. So let's get back to your original question. When you get hacked from a phishing attack and they find your contact list as a company, 
they usually go to your clients, whether we talked about Johnson Johnson, Walmart, whatever, and they're trying to daisy chain up to find ways to attack bigger fish, essentially. And then they find out eventually the fish, the uh, genie's out of the bottle. Hey, that email didn't really come from us. And then you can't keep it hidden. Does that make sense? So yeah. originally you may try to, but the bad guys are literally looking to daisy chain on up and it affects your reputation. And the number one thing I've learned from my clients, most of the time, they're not worried about the money. They are worried about the reputation and they know very quickly to go out and say, yes, we had a breach. I mean, look at all the, the things you just mentioned, um, let alone, uh, uh, some of the really big ones like OPM with the government or, um, you know, credit union or credit check, uh, you know, those things are, are very dangerous and there's lots of information out there and the days of hiding our personal information are unfortunately very few and slim that, that a lot of our stuff is already out there. So Justin, kind of off the subject, but do you think we'll get the, to the place in time where we can do like voting online securely without a risk of a hack or anything like that? Or that's like too much of a fantasy? Uh, wow. Um, that's a tough question too. We've actually, I was just talking to an expert in the field about this and they were going to write a whole paper just on this. Right. And, and could we get there? I will say this. We know that the Russians have influenced are voting in other means, right? It may not be direct tax, but using social media, using these platforms. So we know that their interest is there to do this, right? And they're not the only ones that are doing it. We know that other countries like to manipulate our voting process. So it would have to be something that is so, uh, I think it would be a challenge. I honestly, I, I think it would be a severe challenge because anytime I've seen an entity come out and even say, I've got an unhackable thumb drive, right? What happens? <laughs> There's a bunch of good old boys that sit back. It doesn't even have to be a nation state actor. It could just be some guys that within like a week and a half, they crash. Some, some random teenagers board hex it and I can- an Exactly. Hour. And then they put it out there and they get some notoriety for it. And they go, hey, you know, look, I, I hacked the unhackable within a week and a half. So um, that would be a challenge for me. I, I think it's a, it's a tough road to say that. And I think it's also, we've seen entities, just so you know, I, I won't name names, but uh, uh, that have gone back to paper. They have gone back to paper and storing paper, certain things, purely paper for certain protections. Justin, so cybersecurity laws, is this the same across the board? Like cybersecurity laws, is the same in San Antonio, in New York City, in London, England, or is each location do cybersecurity differently? No, it, it is different. It's very different. So if you're talking about Europe, Europe cybersecurity protections for their people uh, is, is much more extreme than the US. I think we, we would really, uh, their protections within the EU is very severely different and more extreme than what we have here. I think the US is now, um, I think a lot of times I've heard this said, I'm going to kind of repeat this. They'll take a Cessna and strap rockets to it. I don't <laughs> think that we necessarily have this like, you know, this main platform that's protection around the government. I mean, think about it this way. If you invaded um, New York City, a country came in and invaded New York City and took and stole and took over that, our military would get involved. We would have to. We, would, we wouldn't allow that to happen. But yet we can have a country come in and steal and basically invade a whole company and steal these things. And we sit back and don't really, we don't really have a stance for that. And there's a lot of legal uh, framework that's being built right now, either whether from the government, from private industry. And I think companies are taking it upon themselves in this wild, wild west attitude to create their own policies for, for greater protections. And I think they have to. I think that is absolutely the first step for protection is to create policy, just writing the pen and, and then having an expert sit with you and going, where's the biggest bang for our buck to protect ourselves with our subcontractors, with internally, how should we go across this? Justin, from, from, from your experience so far, are you finding that different generations uh, have a different outlook on cybersecurity? 
Yeah. Um, here's the funny thing. I think there's a twist to that question. I think every generation finds it important, but certain generations don't know how to manage it. And there are, so, so the baby boomers or the folks that didn't quite grow up with computers, but have gotten to them, they use computers every day, no doubt, or maybe more senior personnel in organizations understand that cybersecurity is important. But if you go to them and say, hey, well, how are we going to defend against it? Should we bring in a partner like, like my company or others, right? They sit back and go, well, we don't really know how to do that. We don't really understand it. And I think that becomes kind of an Achilles heel and they're not really futurists in that, in that aspect. Where I do think a lot of younger generations are much more in tune with it, but they're not always necessarily in a position of power to, to protect it, right? To, to maybe have the leadership make those decisions to write the checks, et cetera. Um, and then I find the in-between. I find folks that they have educated themselves and they are good at what they do, usually in IT security, IT directors, et cetera. And they think they're covering cybersecurity because of what they've learned over the years, but it's not necessarily, it's more of an IT security, like I mentioned before. They go, oh, we pay for all these platforms that, that, that we have, but we think we're protected. And then, and, and this isn't just us beating our chest, this is just the truth. They pay us to do penetration testing to test those, right? We have a slogan, prove your security, prove it, right? So we come in and we do these things and we show them. In some cases, we go, wow, this was great. You guys are really leading the way here. But in other ways, we, we're able to disable and defeat it. And we have to get across, we got to get rid of that culture of it's a poke in the eye. No, it's not. We're partners. We're working together. We're not here to go, ha ha, look what we were able to find. We want to help you be stronger. And we do it. Uh, and this isn't necessarily the case across the board, unfortunately, but we do it exactly the way the enemy does, right? In the army, and you're, you know, veteran army guy, train as you fight, right? How many times have you heard that? So many times. So many times. But it's a great slogan, right? Train as you fight. Do it the way they do it. Don't, don't just run a software. They're not just running a software. They're not just doing this. They're doing it this particular way. And we need to do it that way to make sure we're beating it the way that they know how to do it. And as they adapt, we have to adapt. So Justin, can you spend some time talking about your military service, what you did in the military and how that has helped you as an entrepreneur? Sure, I'll talk about it a little bit. Some things, unfortunately, I can't really get into, but uh, um, I was a counterintelligence special agent in the army. Um, I uh, spent quite a bit of time doing, uh, I was recruited at 19, believe it or not, and uh, was brought in and I have been working in the intelligence community for quite a while with many agencies from the military perspective. I've done uh, strategic, uh, which is kind of the, the big stuff up, up top and tactical as well, where you're, you know, the guys right there on the ground doing it. Um, counterintelligence, for those of you that don't know, and you mentioned CI, so I know you speak the lingo a little bit when in my bio, but uh, for those of you that don't know, it's counterintelligence, right? So we're countering other intelligence from other countries, entities. Uh, it could be um, crime syndicates have intelligence entities, right? Other countries use it. All sorts of things use their own means of collection, right? Before they, they try to steal something, grab something, manipulate something, et cetera. So countering that is literally as it sounds, right? Um, and I was uh, fortunate enough, but it was, it was tough. I, in Operation Iraqi Freedom, I was with the Expeditionary Force, you know, the first folks down there. I was there for about 14 months. So I've seen it from many, many different angles. But one thing I would like to speak on that did evolve to me being an entrepreneur. So in the last 11 years, I have had the fortunate enough to work directly with industry protecting what we call tech protect, right? So these um, organizations and companies are developing things for DOD and other stuff, and they get paid for these types of contracts. And they're developing amazing things. It could be everything from missile systems to software to, I mean, you name it, everything. Bad guys want this. 
right? We spend billions of dollars developing it and they've realized it's very easy to just steal it. Okay. Corporate espionage. It doesn't even have to be, it could be other companies trying to steal it. Uh, these things, whether it, you know, uh, battling against who's got the latest and greatest cell phone and stealing, you hear about corporate espionage all the time in the news. Folks like myself with a background in this, looking for insider threats, looking for cybersecurity issues, these folks are ultra important to protect your bottom line, to protect these companies' bottom line. And usually folks of my type of background find their way into these companies. Myself, I took it a little bit one step further and said, you know what, we want to develop a company that's built with nothing but experts. These are the people that literally do it every day or have done it every day from the government offensively, defensively, get this pile of experts together and be able to really help industry and really do something and do it at a cost that is cost effective. Um, one of the struggles I do have is a lot of, we go through and we want to beat our chest and say how great and cool we are. And then immediately the company goes, oh, you're too expensive. So we've spent a lot of time making those costs very affordable. And, uh, and I really think whether it doesn't have to be us, but for the companies out there listening, really find an expert in that and have a conversation and talk about your cybersecurity, understand it. Uh, maybe consider paying for a penetration test, have them prove it, show where your gaps are, and then take it baby steps. You don't have to throw the, uh, the whole kitchen sink and the whole budget at it and work from there. So Justin, how does one become a cybersecurity person? Like, is there certain, you have to have a master's degree in something, certain qualifications, certain like certain, like certain tests you got to take? How one can, like, how can I say, I'm Jason Cabin, a cybersecurity person? How does that work? It's kind of tricky. Um, there are, I can only really speak from my background. And really, when I put my company together, and I mentioned earlier with my, uh, with my co-founder, he is very much the technician, okay? I'm very much looking at the human element of it too. And that's something else that gets lost. People forget, they think of cyber threats as a computer, as a bot, as a thing. And there are different softwares and malwares out there, but at the end of the day, it's a human being that's doing this, right? And I think that gets lost a lot of times. But then on the technical side, it's more of what you're talking about, right? So things like, I think a lot of folks maybe out there have heard of CMMC. There's a lot of different certifications and it's on and on and on. And there's many entities, SANS and all these things that they provide all these different certifications. I can only really speak about it um, from the government point of view, right? Where if you go in the military, the army actually has an MOS or a job that's cybersecurity now. I mean, they have, you can walk right in if you qualify for it and start your path that way. And that's a great, I know a lot of people go, well, maybe I don't want to join the military, but you know, the military is not one size fits all, at least the army's not, you know, I mean, depending on what you do in there is a very different experience. And I, I think we're seeing this with all branches and I can only speak from the army because I know that, but there are many different uh, um, qualifications you can seek out yourself. Now, I do encourage if you are a company that has hired a quote unquote cybersecurity specialist, that's not just IT uh, or maybe is dual hatted that you pay for them to go out and do these other ethical hacking courses, stuff like that. But one thing I want to say that I think is very important. It is very important to not have your IT people doing your penetration testing. And the reason is you don't want the Fox that's guarding the hen house. Right, the whole point is to bring in an outside viewpoint and have them looking at that. And I think we see that a lot where they pay for a pen test software. And again, penetration testing one size doesn't fit all. And they go, oh, we do it ourselves. Well, you know the network. Why not hire someone that does it that doesn't know anything and comes in what we call black box, right? They know nothing about it and can look at the social media, look at the company, look at the people and then work their way in that way. And um, I think these are all kind of tricky misnomers that we need to start navigating through within industry personally. So Justin, back to being an entrepreneur, 
you know, I think this is myth or stereotype that being an entrepreneur is all you know comes with rainbows. You start a company six months later, you know, you're you know you're on a, on a beach drinking drinking pina coladas. Oh, if only. <laughs> Can you talk about some of the challenges you've had to face and overcome as a, as an entrepreneur? Yes, absolutely. And and mine have been, um, I think there may be some other companies that can maybe speak on this as well, but we started a servicing company, right? And as a servicing company, it's not what a lot of investors like to hear. I've noticed that. And I didn't understand that for a long time. And we develop our own software. We're actually developing some software suites that are amazing. We've got one that we're developing now that we can literally tell if you've ever been hacked or currently hacked. And not just from known threats, because a lot of antivirus, stuff that you hear out there and love to talk about known stuff, but they don't know unknown. We can find those anomalies and, and understand those unknown. But as we develop that software, no matter how great it is, and we talk to investors, they go, well, you're a servicing company. Ooh, that's only an X type. If we go to sell, that's only this. If you're going to do the SaaS model, you got to break out and do your own company, do this stuff. So what I decided to do, and, and, and again, I'm learning like everyone else, uh, we decided to fund ourselves. We have experts. We use the servicing company. It's doing well. We're very, uh, we have a great reputation. And then take X amount of that and put that back into our software development so we don't lose equity, right? And the other thing that we didn't want to do is we didn't want too many shiny objects, and what I mean by that is, if we're starting to truly develop and do well in the servicing industry and grab new markets and great stuff and do virtual CISO like we are in bigger companies, and then stop everything that we're doing and all the money that we're bringing in and they go, now we're going to try this SaaS piece, right? So I think you have to kind of pick your fights and really decide what you're doing. And it's not that you can't do them at the same time. But I think investors, at least in my limited experience, have been very much, they want you to commit to what they're going to give you money to. And so I don't think that there's one size, again, not one size fits all. I, I think uh, some, some of the things I've seen and some of the uh, schooling I've been to for being an entrepreneur want you to do it this way, right? Yeah. Or they did it this way, right? You laugh because that's what we're hearing the same stuff, right? You got to follow their model. You got you to walk this to this line. I personally, that's just not be, not been my experience. So, so Justin, I believe in your LinkedIn profile, you talk about the points of customer service, the user experience to cybersecurity companies. Can you like go into that more detail? Why is that, why is customer the customer experience so important? Yeah. Um, again, I think this just goes to one professionalism, right, and two expertise. And one of the things that we uh, one of the things that, that we try to strive for is understanding a company culture, right? So whether we're working in a manufacturing company or a financial company, their culture is going to be different, whether from compliance needs, like we talked about before, or just their overall corporate culture. So, uh, and even within those subsets, it gets different. Okay. So we've worked with companies that have done construction, right? That culture, you really have to understand and not think, again, one size fits all. So when you work with them, when you talk to them, you have to take time. Again, it's not just a software that you're running and go, well, we'll see what happens, right? You take time to understand what they're trying to accomplish, where their needs are, and then what we're trying to protect. And also, when we do this all, all the time with our penetration testing, the rules of engagement. So what I mean by that in ROE, this is very much a military term, but we use it in our penetration testing. You as the client have to decide what your comfort level is, essentially, right? What your threat level is. When we show you things and we go, hey, we noticed this software on here and bad guys use this. Do you know that? And they go, well, we use it too. We use the software all the time. We have to continue to use this. Well, then you accept that level of threat, right? You go that risk, that, excuse me, that level of risk. You go, hey, you know, we, we need this. And that's okay. We know. But many times we'll go, hey, you've got this software here. And they go, I don't know what that is. You go, well, who installed this on here? And they go, I, I don't even know. Well, let's, let's take a look, right? 
So we, we are very much uh, looking at the culture, looking at their level of risk, looking at the rules of engagement. And many times we've had, uh, we do phishing attacks, simulated phishing attacks with our pin testing. Again, we do it the way the bad guys do it. Some companies have come back to us and said, hey, we don't want to embarrass anyone. We, we don't want to take that risk. We know if they click on the thing or give their credentials, we don't want to embarrass them. Well, don't get me wrong. I, 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 that's admirable. I understand. But that's how we get better, right? We, we understand where our weaknesses are. But for us, we are respectful to everyone's uh, culture. And we build our framework and create something custom for that. So, so Justin, what advice do you have for people looking for their first cybersecurity job right now? Um, I think it's tough. I think it's, I, I've actually been following this on LinkedIn. There's a lot of people that like to speak about this topic of like, how do I get in? How do I get better? How do I get reputable? Um, I think one thing that gives you notoriety when you, when you're trying to get in this field, there's a lot of hackathon. There's a lot of these entities that put on these shows. You could bring in a team and, and try to see who can get what, or, uh, maybe get some sponsorship by your company to go in and do the best you can. Um, I think those are great because you get notoriety and experience from that. Uh, it's tough because you're either hacking, quote unquote, and doing it illegally, right? Because unless a company allows you like us, pays us, gives us the rules of engagement, says come in and do this, it's kind of tough to do this on someone and quote unquote practice without getting yourself in hot water, right? <laughs> because how are you practicing, right? You're, you're, you're going in and you're kind of fiddling with things. So it is a tough road. Um, that's why I do think for young people to really consider different military options, because you kind of get the keys to the kingdom and they're going to put you in situations where they go, 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 go do it. You've learned it. We've, we've tested you on this. We've sent you to not just military training, but uh, gov or, uh, uh, industry training as well. And they'll pay for everything. So uh, again, that's just m from my point of view. So Justin, when you are ready to bring on like a cybersecurity person, what, what qualification do you look for for your company? For me, it's different. We are looking for people that are within a very small family that people, other people cannot really reach. So we bring in the expert, for example, red teaming or forensics, a client needs forensics, or they want pen testing, or they want this special, we bring in the people that just do that. They're certified just in that. And they have that military and government experience. And the only way you would really be able to reach out to them is to have kind of that inner circle talk. So it's not really fair to compare apples to apples that way of, of how we recruit our uh, our personnel because they are truly the experts that are doing it all the time. So just as an entrepreneur, you're doing a lot, you know, sales, marketing, et cetera, et cetera. On a daily basis, how do you focus on what you need to focus on that day? How do you focus on the priority of the important things? And said, so like a lot of people that go, a lot of people that have a list of one, one to 100, they start out on thing number 100. How do you focus on the number of priority that day? And how do you figure that out? Well, I think from the CEO perspective, I look at two things constantly, body checking myself. Um, I mean, many things, but two things that always trigger. One, legal stuff, right? Because we're, we're working with clients and there's many sensitive things, information, systems. Uh, I'm always double checking the, uh, just where we are legally in the framework, as well as financially, right? And when I prioritize what I'm working on, I very much sit back and try not to look at too many shiny objects like I mentioned before. I get calls from people that want to partner all the time and we have great partners. We have amazing partners, but it's tough to start something new all the time. We need to look at what we have now and execute on those things. We have to execute. We have to execute surgically, no different than the military or football team that execution is so key and make sure we're doing it to the best of our ability. And I'm a big believer in keep it small, keep it all. That's just my methodology, right? And what I mean by that is stay lightweight. I, and, and I love how COVID has, 
you know, one of the very few benefits of COVID because it's been so tough on, on the world is I think industry now during this COVID time is going, wow, we don't need these storefronts. We've never had that. We've got people all over the country that, that work for me. And why do I need a storefront for this, right? And if I were to go speak to a client, now this is my particular company, right? All companies are different. But if I'm going to go talk to a client, it's cheaper for me to reserve the Capital City Club if I want to show off or something nice, then always have that overhead, right? Stay lightweight, keep it small, keep it all, especially when you're starting and don't get distracted by shiny objects. And I mean everything from business cards to you know, paying people to do all these, these websites, et cetera, and all these things. It depends on your stuff, but really keep it to the core of your business. And I, I think that's helped us. Justin, how do you take care of yourself? Like how do you make sure you don't get burnt out? What, what do you do for that? I, well, one, I'm a firm believer of you take care of your team, especially in a business like ours, where you have experts. You can't just recruit. You're not just getting another person working a fast food job, right? They're not just cycling and opening. You have to look at your people and you have to communicate. You have to communicate all the time. And unfortunately, I think sometimes when you have a geographic uh, distance, like I was just talking about, and you have different time zones, that can be tough. So I try to take the time. Um, I'm very big believer in on the spot bonuses. I'm a very big believer in things that people don't see coming, that they feel good about. And it doesn't have to be a lot of money, but to just constantly feel appreciated and heard. And I, unfortunately, I don't, I don't think that that happens enough uh, in that many leaders, you know, what do they always say that people quit uh, uh, managers, they don't quit jobs, right? And I think uh, I read this once in one leadership course or, or something I was in. And it said, if you have someone quit from you, wait about a month to two months and then call them back and ask them honestly at that point, if they're willing to talk to you and say, hey, why did you quit now? And usually they found another position or they've already left and they'll go, hey, Justin, look, man, you were giving all the work to me and these people weren't picking up. And these are things that they're not going to tell you when they leave. And that's how you learn as a leader to go, wow, I didn't even know that that was happening. Wow, I didn't even understand my own company's culture. And usually communication is the key to that. But it's, so just, it's a tricky game, yeah. Just a random question. For people in the cybersecurity field, do they tend to be introverts, extroverts, or is that pretty much an even distribution between those two? Uh, mm. I've noticed that there are a lot of introverts, but you got to understand when you talk about an introvert doesn't mean that they can't be extroverted when they need to. In fact, I'm very long winded, which you could probably tell here, right? But being an extrovert, being that, you know, we, we learned a lot about this in my past life. It, it takes energy to do the opposite understand that. So for me to sit down and work on a report and not work with anyone, it takes energy for me to do that. But that doesn't mean I can't. It's the same thing with an introvert. An introvert can be working on this, doing a pen test, doing the technical side of it, sitting down, but that doesn't mean that they can't get up. And I've found most of the many great briefers are introverts, but when they're done with the briefing, they're exhausted. They're done. You have to make time for them to you can't drive them on all day, right? But they'll get straight to the point. They'll tell you exactly what they need to do. And they'll be very professional with that. I've seen a little bit of both, but we have some folks that uh, I think kind of play on both sides. Uh, in fact, sometimes we'll, we'll play games with each other and be like, hey, would you be willing to do this? And that crosses their comfort zone. Would you be willing to speak to 200 people? Well, no, 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 that's too much for me. I just want to do a, a business meeting, a board meeting. We'll brief that here. Okay, okay. So, um, but I don't think that that should keep someone from pursuing um, a job in cybersecurity. However, I do think that you need to know what it is. These people are sitting behind computers. They're focused on what they're doing. They get in the zone and they can get lost in rabbit holes, right? They can get, they are focused on that. And uh, if you're someone that needs to get up 
and you just can't do that every day, it would be a challenge for you. I, I, I personally think that may be something that'd be challenging. So just that's a great follow question. How do you prevent you people from going down rabbit holes? I have to imagine there's probably hundreds of rabbit holes that can go down. Like, how do you prevent that? Well, first, how do you even know they're going down rabbit holes? Absolutely. Um, one, we're very lucky because my guys are straight professionals and they'll admit it. They know when they do, right? But what they'll do is they'll give me options. So they'll go, hey, we were doing a penetration test, for example, and we've identified four possibles right? But these possibles are going to take X amount of time. One thing we have to realize is the bad guys aren't on an hourly wage, right? They're not on like a time limit. <laughs> they work however long that they want. They'll be up all night to them. It's the game of like, can we get it? When we're doing it, we have to, we have to execute. Like I just said, like how much we can't do this for three months. And a client goes, are you done yet? You know? So they'll give us options, but we'll sit back and we have reports and they'll report back up and go, here's where we're at. What do you think? We were able to do this from here, but we have three other possibles. Would you like us to go down those rabbit holes? And then we have a conversation, right? So we may pick two out of three. We may give each one of those X amount of hours. And we kind of decide that because the reality is the folks that are good at this, you don't know what you don't know. And as they start to unravel that onion, then you go, wow, I have to pivot. I now have to pivot again. Um, and, and we have to just be professionals and be able to adjust fire for that. Justin, how do you go about educate, educating the business owners? Like you, a company signs with you and a month later, they're like, man, I'm wasting too much money on you. You know, hurry up, you know, do this faster, do this differently. How much time do you have to spend educating people? I think it really depends on the company. I think it really depends on, we'll either see a couple different stances, right? One will be a company that's going, we need this. We understand the threat. We know they're, they're very humble. They'll go, we're bringing you in and, and we want to be educated. We want to hear more. We want that. And we love those obviously, right? Those are usually the easiest sells. They're usually, uh, uh, follow-up sales where we do one thing and then we expose X amount and they want monthly servicing after that, et cetera. Then there's the other. And like I said, every generation knows it's important. So keep in mind what I said earlier. The other stance is, um, hey, uh, we know it's important. We want to bring you in. We want to talk about it, but we, we, uh, are you going to make more work for us, right? And these are fair questions, by the way. These are not, I'm not making fun of it, but we have to educate them going, no, we, we don't make more work for you because here's how we do it, right? Here's how we set it up. We'll do it after hours. We'll do it only, again, those rules of engagement. We'll only work during this time. We'll only work during that time. We have people that could do remediation for you. So you don't even have to do your own remediation. A lot of clients we've realized to get in for the door want turnkey, okay? Now, the, the problem is sometimes they don't want to pay for turnkey, right? But the reality is, and this is something, if, if you're out there, if you're a company listening now and you're considering bringing in someone for cybersecurity or even hiring someone for cybersecurity, I will say this. Hiring someone for cybersecurity or as a virtual CISO will cost you 150 to, I mean, even up to $250,000 to get a true expert, right? And I mean, at the C level as a CISO, you're going to get one person, you're going to pay that much money. And they're one person, they can only do what they could do. They're going to eventually want a staff, they're going to want people under them, they're going to need the IT people to help them with remediation, which is going to take from what they're wanting to do, etc. It is so much more cost effective, <clears throat> effective, and this is another reason why we decided to start this business, to hire us, you're not paying them benefits, you're, we are a fraction of the cost, and we can come in and do this at the level and customize it to you, and you're getting a team. You're getting a team of experts. You have, when something bad happens, you can call us, and we've got people that just handle that thing that we can call up and get in there. So... I do think that uh, um, you really have to consider those things. Hey, do we really want to hire someone? And it's also not fair to put that on your IT folks as well. Hey, IT, you're doing all these things, 
and IT security, the firewalls, the guns, gates, guards type stuff. Now we want you to do cybersecurity. And a lot of times they go, well, that's not really my, my background. Again, you can find a, uh, a company that can help you with this like ours. It doesn't have to be us, but, but there are many uh, out there that you can take a look at and ask the right questions. Just the next, I want you to talk about your company some more, like why you started it, how it got started, what you're focused on right now, and probably more importantly, what's your vision for your company moving forward? Well, we started it, like I mentioned before, that I had worked in industry and I've always been interested in being an entrepreneur. I'd always listened to, I, I, I've been very uh, flattered to be in rooms with many high power, very powerful C-level folks from many in academia, in companies, big companies, small companies. And I've learned from them. I've listened over all these years. And I went, man, I think this is something that I could do. I think this is something that I would, I would enjoy. So then the next question was, well, do what? What are we going to do? Now, my background is looking for insider threats. Okay. In fact, ironically, I crossed over into cybersecurity on accident. Uh, again, you know, we're not in the Cold War era anymore where people are doing dead drops and talking to folks. Every time they try to get intelligence from companies and steal things, there's going to be a thumb drive, the internet, there's going to be a cyber element to it somewhere. And we have to adapt. And I think a lot of the folks that retired out were going, whew, oh, I'm glad I'm retiring now because, because the game changed, Right. And, uh, and so the more and more we started to identify and, and I was being educated of how they do it and, and the different capable capabilities and TTPs of what you can do out there, I started to be really um, scared, to be honest, of how easy it was, right? Of, of, of how effective and cost-effective it was for them. So then I said, this is my company. We're gonna do cybersecurity. So I reached to a uh, my my uh, co-founder. We both started in the same roots in the army. He is an absolute skill set. He's a professional and just the best at what he does. And he went cyber a long time ago before it was cool, right? And we sat down and said, how are we going to do this? And truly with a mission to protect industry. And how can we make it cost effective and lightweight? And I think we've done that. And everything moving forward from there uh, we've been around for, I think, going on four years now, and uh, we've established our reputation. That was a big thing at first. Even though we had all this great government experience, companies go, well, who else have you worked with, right? And that's fair. That's, a, you know, what are your references? Uh, yeah, we know you're, you're government guys. We're sure you're great, but, but uh, did they like you, right? And so we've had to kind of build that up like any small company would starting out. And then it has just started to snowball from there. And um, and we've been very fortunate. So Justin, is there anything that I sort of asked you that I have not asked you yet? You know, um, let me, I, I think we've talked about a lot of things. I, I think we've talked about, uh, I, I know one other thing I would like to talk about is um, what the options are out there for services, okay? We make a lot of money or enough money doing penetration testing. And the only reason why I think we do, it's not that it's not important. And it's not that it's not something that companies need to focus on. It's because it's a term that companies have heard. And the problem is there's more cybersecurity options out there, but you may not be aware of them so they don't know what to ask. So they just go, I've heard of that pin test thing. Let's try that. That may not be the thing that you need. So we provide just to kind of give a hit list of the things that we do and what they are and, and asking other companies you talk to, we provide monthly monitoring, right? Where we look for vulnerabilities. We look for uh, compliance. We do the whole bit and it's uh, uh, continuous monitoring. And every month we provide you a report and we give you the top five criticals and your IT goes, yeah, we work with you on that. Yeah, we're going to work on this. We're going to work on that. And it keeps you healthy. We do penetration testing, like I mentioned. And by the way, you get what you pay for. We're not doing a software run. That's something I hear a lot. Oh, yeah, we get a pen test every quarter. Whoa. Are you, are, what, wow. How are you, how are you doing that? 
oh yeah, we run this software. That's not a pen test. That's a vulnerability scan. So I think a lot of other companies have kind of used these terms and these terms get muddied in the water and we don't really know what we're, what we're getting. Uh, in our case, a pen test is experts coming in. They could do external, or internal, or both. They're looking at that stuff. They're working with it just like the bad guy would. We're doing phishing attacks. We give a full report. And then we work on remediation also, not just what was wrong, but how do we fix it? What are the countermeasures? We also supply a thing called a compromise assessment. And this is something no one really knows about. And this is the thing we were developing the software for. I mentioned earlier, we have the capability to look internally and give you what we call a clean bill of health. We can find out, and what a lot of people don't know is bad guys, when they get in and do these back doors, like solar winds, all these other things that you hear, yes, those patches come out very quickly. But if they have already gotten in in the back door, they're going to sit there and then go around and try to get back into that. They may not, you may not notice that they're there. They'll sit on networks, God, we've seen for months before they even are able to get back around to who they were able to get into. Our compromise assessment literally does that. We assess if you've been compromised. We constantly look and we do a white list and black list of all your services, startups, many different things, and get rid of the things that are possible compromise, the white list, the things that are good, and give you a clean bill of health and keep things clean on a month to month. So we do forensics. That's something if you need it and somebody does something. There's just many different options out there. Again, it's not one size fits all. So, Justin, I understand you have something for our listeners today. Yeah, I just wanted for everyone that's, that's listening, we just wanted to offer and uh, thank you for taking the time to come out and listen to Jason and myself. Uh, we wanted to offer one month free with our monitoring. If this is something that you've listened to and you're... Um, interested in cybersecurity and, uh, you know, looking to take the next step or want some consulting about taking the next step, you can check us out. Uh, our website is www.shanken, S-H-A-N-K-E-N, uh, security solutions with an S, uh, dot com. And uh, just say, hey, I heard you on the, uh, on the podcast with Jason and you instantly get one month free. And we're also offering uh, a free scan. We will scan your company and just see what we can find and then have a conversation about that and move from there. And uh, it can either take it to the next level or we sit back and go, you know what, maybe, uh, maybe we aren't the right fit for each other. But either way, have an open and honest conversation. Justin, can you share your social media, social media links for both yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? I'm sorry, what was that? Can you give, can you give your social media links so people can reach out to you? Yeah, uh, again, it's, uh, uh, I'd, I'd have to look. We, we've got a whole social media. I've got folks that are working on that, but uh, we're on LinkedIn. Uh, it's still Schenken Security Solutions. So you can find us on LinkedIn. You can find us on Facebook, uh, same thing, uh, Schenken Security Solutions. And uh, we're on Instagram also. Uh, so if, if you come find us and check us out, uh, if you're interested in what we have or have any questions, you can hit us up there. Or uh, you can write us to at sales at uh, shankinsecuritysolutions.com. And we have that for, for our emails and we're constantly getting, you know, folks with questions. And also another thing that's very popular right now, if you're listening and you're dealing with CMMC, we can help you with that. And those that don't know what that is, good, good for you. Those that do know what it is, we're waiting for your call. <laughs> so uh, it's just one of those things. So. And to our listeners, we have the link to his, his gift, the resource, and his social media links on our show notes. You can find the show notes at www.kevinshrblog.com. And be sure to support the Kevin CHR crowdfunding campaign that ends April 28th at https slash crowdfunding. Justin, we're coming to the end of our time together. Can you give us any wisdom or advice or anything you want to talk about? I just want to say thank you for having me on. Um, you've had some great, great folks uh, and, and great for small businesses, right? To, to realize just the, um, just we're all out there. And I, I really highly recommend find mentors, find people out there. They could be younger than you. They could be older than you. They could be, you know, we are not the experts at everything, right? And I think a wise man told me and, and words I live by, if you have someone that's better than you at something, either hire that person or, or communicate with that person 
and and bring them on as part of your team. Don't don't take it on your own shoulders. Uh, and and I think you'll be stronger for it. Just I think it's good advice. I think many of us are, are need to be more humble and realize a lot of our, our greatest mentors can actually be people younger than us. Absolutely. I, I, gosh, that is just the truth. And um, and it, it does not have to be, we're always so used to the mentor in a traditional sense. And I think I've been very, very fortunate uh, in, in my lifetime of the mentors I've had, and I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for them. And, and several of them are younger than myself, and they're in all different spectrums of life. And uh, they've all been willing to help, and I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for them. Justin, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Jason. I appreciate you having me on. It's been great. Thanks. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.